Don't Ever Stop at the Traveling Spooktacular Roadshow by Brandon Faircloth. Fifteen years ago, I was driving down a dark road with my two best friends in the world. Evan, who I'd known since the fourth grade and I'd been dating since the tenth, and Peter, who'd we met our first day of high school. We were sophomores in college at the time, all back in town together for the weekend. Our first time together in two months to hang out and celebrate Halloween. My stomach was in knots at being around them both again. I'd known for some time that things with Evan were fading out, and I'd had my excuses for why that was so. It was young love, we were at different colleges and growing apart, etc. It was only as Peter and I began talking more and more about the what-ifs of some possible future together in the past few weeks that I'd come to understand what I had to do. I'd give us all this last good weekend together, and then, gently as possible, I'd end things with Evan. We'd been on our way to a Halloween party that night. It was being thrown by an old high school friend, but I could tell that Evan and Peter weren't any more excited about going than I was. We were all faking a level of enthusiasm that we didn't feel to try to keep the other two happy and entertained, and while the sentiment was kind, it still led to us staring down the barrel of hours of forced reunions and awkward conversations with people we didn't really talk to anymore. Evan saw the lights up ahead first, and when he called out to us, I felt a twinge of relief and excitement at the orange marquee with its flashing light bulb arrows and blinding neon skulls. The lettering on the sign stood in shabby contrast to the care that had been shown to the sign itself, with mismatched back reader board letters trailing across the single line. The Traveling Spooktacular Roadshow. Hey, Becca, slow down, let's check this place out. I could hear the excitement in Evan's voice and felt a new twinge of guilt. He really was a good guy, and I wasn't sure what I'd had to do wasn't going to break up our trio for good. Pushing the thought aside, I tried to smile at him. You sure? Aren't you super pumped to get to Eric's party? He rolled his eyes as Peter leaned in between us. Cut the shit. (laughs) None of us want to go to that, really. Being a few minutes late to check this weird shit out can't hurt. He met my eyes for a moment before I looked away. Peter had been harsher with me this weekend and quick to side with whatever Evan wanted to do, and I got it. He didn't know when I was going to talk to Evan, but he knew it was coming, and the combination of guilt and wanting to maintain appearances made it easy for us to both focus on making Evan happy and avoid acting too chummy with each other. Grimacing, I slowed the car and turned onto the small dirt track that would pass the sign into the dark. We only had 50 feet to go before I could see the glow of pumpkin lights strung across the frame of what looked like an old tour bus. A single spotlight lit the open side door at the front of the bus, and next to it was an elaborately carved wooden sign that said, Enter if you dare. Raising my eyebrows, I glanced back at Evan and Peter. Well, this shit looks sketchy as fuck. Evan grinned. (laughs) Yeah, right? It's awesome. I didn't even know this was here. Peter looked at him and then back at me. Yeah. Me either. I don't think it was. I mean, when I came back into town last night, I came this way. There wasn't any sign out then. It was late and I was tired, but I wasn't that tired. Evan shrugged. Maybe they just didn't have the sign on anymore. He said you got in after midnight. Peter looked out at the bus as he sat back. Maybe, but is this thing even open? Where are the people? It's the night before Halloween and no one's out here? They could be setting up for tomorrow. I nodded. That, or it's some cover for a holiday mess sale. Either way, it looks creepy. Evan frowned at me. So were you both against me? I heard Peter suck in a breath and swallowed. No, no. I'm not saying that. I just... Well, if you want to check it out, see if it's open, then we will. I turned my head slightly without looking at Peter. Right? From the shadows of the back seat, Peter's voice sounded far away. Sure, man, it'll be fun. 
We looked around the outside of the bus for someone to ask about a ticket or if they were even open, but there was no sign of anyone. Pointing at the open door, Evan said maybe we paid inside or it was just a free attraction someone had set up for fun. When he grabbed my hand and started forward, I went without complaint as Pierre brought up the rear. Climbing the five narrow metal steps inside the doorway led us to a large driver's cabin with a cracked, red vinyl seat and large steering wheel wrapped in some kind of skin. There was no sign of a driver or a guide, however, just the way we'd come and the way forward, which lay through a thick black curtain that divided the driver's cab from the rest of the bus. Giving me a nervous smile, Evan pushed past the barrier, and we followed. I felt a sense of relief at what lay on the other side. It really was just a small haunt. The interior of the bus had been heavily customized, and it looked as though it had been hollowed out to make space for several discreet rooms in the long, wide body of the bus. The first held a decent-looking plastic corpse tied to a bed frame. Periodically, the sound of electric zaps would play from a hidden speaker as the body jolted and twisted in time with some internal mechanism. Peter let out a small laugh behind me. <laughs> That's pretty cool. The next room was littered with rubber body parts, and in the corner, a large drum bubbled as heads and hands bobbed on the surface of a misty brew. As we drew closer, a snake lunged out from beneath the water, causing Evan to jump as I let out a yelp. Cursing, I shook my head. Yeah, that got me. I found myself actually growing tense, wondering if there would be a third room, and if so, what it might hold. There was a third room, and a fourth, and a fifth, and a sixth. All similar in quality, but different in theme. It was actually a surprisingly good haunt, even though it was strange that we hadn't seen or heard any actors or other staff yet. Still, my unease was growing steadily with each new scene, and not because of the jump scares or the animatronic monsters, but because... How the fuck is this thing this big? Peter's words were barely a whisper, scarcely audible above the whining strains of creepy violin filling the funeral parlor we were in. A small white coffin lay to one side, and I felt sure something was going to spring from it as we got closer. Still, his words concerned me a lot more as they echoed my own thoughts. As Evan looked back, I saw he'd heard it too, and the expression on his face mirrored my own. I... Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Evan looked around. This is what, our sixth room? Seventh, I think. I didn't turn around, but I could hear the worry in Peter's voice. Okay, seventh. And we looked around pretty good outside, right? There wasn't another bus or building or something attached to this thing? Or am I crazy? I shook my head slowly. No. You're not crazy. Looking down at the floor, I frowned. Maybe... I don't know, maybe it's a trick? Like, the floor's been sloping down and they actually built the rest of the place underground? I know that sounds dumb, but it really feels like we've gone farther than the bus is long, so maybe we're not really on the bus anymore. Evan nodded slowly. I don't know. Maybe. Or maybe we're just misjudging things. This might be the last, or, well, at least one of the last rooms. We have to be close to the end if it's just the bus, right? I nodded back, and behind me, I heard Peter puff out a breath before adding. Yeah, man, I, I bet we're close. So we went on. The rooms continued on. At first, we were silent except for the occasional gasp when something startled one of us. Then we began making nervous jokes about how this would never end and how it really was impressive and how we'd have to tell people about this place once we got out. By the second hour, we were going through the rooms at a near walking run, ignoring most of the scenes as we held each other's hands and focused on pushing forward. We were at room 60 or 70 by this point, and while there had been some repeated broad themes, we hadn't run across the same room twice. 
There were no branching paths or even noticeable curves, which meant that we'd somehow traveled in a straight line for what I'd guessed was close to three miles. I based that guess in part on the changing size of the rooms themselves. As we went, they'd slowly gotten wider and longer, so that by the time I glanced at my phone and I saw it was after ten o'clock, we could barely make out the next black curtain at the far end of a fog-shrouded cemetery, and even the side walls were so far away we couldn't touch them, standing side by side. Peter was the first person to suggest turning around and going back the way we came. Evan was against it from the start, insisting it had to end at some point and that so far nothing bad had happened. It was all fake dolls and robots. Nothing real. And we'd have such a good story to tell when we got done, right? I agreed with Evan to keep going, but not because I believed what he said. It was because I could tell he didn't believe it either. It was a desperate sheen to his eyes in the yellow light of the artificial graveyard moon, a look that said what was being echoed in my own heart of hearts. So long as we kept going, we could pretend like things were okay, but what if we tried to go back and... What if we tried to go back and it wouldn't let us? I lost count of the rooms we traveled through. I was thirsty and tired, but above all, terrified. I could feel myself edging closer to panic with every new place we visited, and the only thing worse than my fear of going on was my fear of what might happen if we didn't. And then suddenly, we stepped off a bloody hill littered with plastic sacrifices to some strange wooden effigy and found ourselves in a large stone room. The room was different than the others. It was round, and there was no sign of another curtain at the far end of that circle. In the middle, surrounded by three large silk pillows, was a short stone table that seemed carved from the rock of the room itself. On that table was a single, laminated card of bright yellow. It said, Be seated. Tell the others your most frightening story. Above all, tell the truth. We were all in shock by then, I think grateful for anything different than the never-ending haunt, ready to take any guidance that might provide a way forward and out. We didn't even question the instructions. We all sat down on the pillow, staring across the table at each other. I already knew what story I had to tell. The memory had come back to me as soon as I'd seen the card. So I raised the hand, and without preamble, I began. When I was eight, there was a man that lived at the end of our street. This was a year before you moved to town, Evan, and I never told you about it because I was afraid you'd freak out and you'd stop coming over to play. Anyway, this man, he lived in the neighborhood a long time. Everyone liked him and his family. They were the kind of people that would loan you stuff if you needed it. I remember my dad had used his lawnmower for a month when ours died, and they always decorated their house and massive yard for the holidays. That was the first thing that I noticed that year. They hadn't decorated for Halloween. Not only that, but his kids hadn't been to school in over two weeks, and no one had seen the man or his wife either. We weren't a nosy neighborhood, but one night my mom called over there to make sure that they were all doing okay. The man answered, telling her they'd all been down with the flu, but that they were doing better said he appreciated the call and he'd have to come visit us soon. She told me and dad about the call, but she seemed strange, like she was still worried about something. Maybe that's why I paid so much attention to the man's house as we drove by the next day. I was excited when I saw him out in the yard, raking up huge, neat piles of autumn leaves. It was still early, and he was nearly done, so I guess he'd been at it since before the sun had come up. I called out to Mom, I think hoping that pointing out that he was working in the yard would somehow make her feel better, and at first it did. She slowed the car a little and gave him a wave as we drove by. It was when he was returning the wave that I heard my mother gasp. Oh, God. 
I looked at her, then followed her gaze back to a distant part of the yard, to one of the piles of red and gold leaves that had started to scatter in the cool morning breeze, to the thing that poked out from beneath it. It was part of a leg. She drove on, making it three blocks into town before she saw a police car and flagged it down. The cop didn't take her serious at first. He thought she was playing a joke or had mistaken Halloween decorations for the real thing. But she knew better, and when she threatened to call his superior if he didn't check into it, he grudgingly relented. An hour later, our street was filled with lights and sirens. They'd already arrested the man. They'd found him still raking the yard, carefully restacking the leaves the wind kept trying to carry away as though he was tucking in the dismembered corpse of his family for a long sleep. My mouth closed with an audible snap as I finished the story. I'd never told anyone that before, and my parents hadn't mentioned it since the man had been found hanging from his bedsheets at an institution upstate a few months after the murders. This was all so strange and then it was Peter's turn. Uh, my dad used to be in the military. You guys know that. Well, before I was born, maybe before my parents were even married, he was stationed in Germany for a couple of years. He was really young back then, and he's told me some wild stories from his time there. Getting in fights, doing dumb shit with his buddies, you know. But one story he only told me once. It was one night not long before he died. He was drinking a lot by then. I don't think the booze helped the pain that much, but it seemed to make him worry less about the cancer and leaving us behind. Those nights he'd stayed up late talking to us, almost... Almost like he was trying to get in as much time with us as he could before it was too late. This night, Mom had fallen asleep, but the two of us were still playing cards and talking. We'd watched a scary movie earlier in the night, and that made me think to ask him what was the scariest place he'd ever been. I expected him to talk about one of the few times he saw combat, or something from his childhood. Or maybe not have an answer at all, but instead, he immediately sat his cards down and looked at me. It was a place called the Red Circle. It's in Croatia. Me and a buddy had a week's leave and decided to travel Europe some. We'd heard Croatia was cheap and full of beautiful scenery and women. That was all true. But as we traveled around, we kept hearing different people talk about this place called the Red Circle. That if we were looking for adventure, we needed to visit the Red Circle. We wanted a story to tell go to the Red Circle. My father shrugged slightly. These were strangers we were shooting the shit with at a bar, so at first we didn't pay much attention. Whenever we asked what the Red Circle was or why it was so great, they would always get real dodgy. Talk about it being haunted or some bullshit. He sighed. Still, the fact that it kept coming up in different groups, in different towns even... We got curious. While they were always scarce on the details of what went on there, everyone who mentioned it to us was real good at telling us how to get there. So our last night we went. The directions took us out on a country road into the middle of the woods, and we were about to turn around, having decided that it was all a practical joke that locals played on stupid Americans when we saw the start of the village. <sighs> place was dead. Long dead. There were no people or cars. Hell, I don't even know if there'd ever been cars in that place. It was creepy as hell. We loved it. It felt like we were on an archaeological dig, finding a place that time had forgotten. We just walked around it at first, but we kept pushing each other, showing off how brave we were, and before long... We were going into the empty houses and stores, the rotting chapel of the decaying city hall. And with each place that we visited, 
we somehow grew both more terrified and more driven to keep looking. Not because the buildings were abandoned. It was because of the holes. Every shop, every home, nearly every single place we visited had a large hole in the floor. It might be in the middle of a room or some dark corner of a basement, but it was nearly always there. And these weren't holes that were being dug, either. Between the dirt being pushed away and the broken floorboards pointed up at the ceiling, it seemed clear to us that something had come up from underneath. Underground. I don't know why we didn't leave sooner. We were both close to pissing our pants before we were halfway done, and it wasn't until we heard the noise that we finally broke for the car and got out of there. We heard it first at what looked like a tiny post office, and then next door to what had once been a bar or a restaurant, I think. It was a thumping noise, kind of like a weird heartbeat, coming from those holes and getting closer. My father wiped his mouth before looking dubiously at his empty glass. I... We ran. Didn't tell anybody about what we saw or heard. There was no point. They'd never believe us. And over the years, I stopped believing it much myself. His eyes flickered up to mine for a minute. And then... A few years back, I heard from my old army buddy. He wasn't doing too good. He said he kept dreaming that he woke up down in the dark, down beneath the earth in some mine or cave. He couldn't see much of anything, but he could hear that sound. Thumping. Thumping as something came for him. He let out a short laugh. <laughs> I blew him off. Told him he just needed to let that shit go. Get some help if he couldn't. He lowered his eyes. I heard later he killed himself. I didn't know what to say. My father wasn't an emotional man at the best of times, and now he seemed on the verge of tears. Dad, I... He cut me off. Thing is, I still didn't believe him. Didn't want to. Until last week. His smile was terrible as he looked up at the ceiling. Because last week, I started to have the dream too. Peter stopped talking suddenly, turning to Evan as my own gaze shifted in the same direction. Face pale, Evan began to speak. One night last year, this was late September, I think, I was up late. It might sound dumb, but even after a month in the dorm, I still had trouble getting to sleep a lot of nights. It wasn't my bed, my room, my town, you know. Some nights I'd go for a walk or read for a while, and on this night in particular, I'd open a window to judge the weather for a walk before heading out. That's when I saw the person in the bear costume. They were just... Standing out there on the lawn of the dorm, a figure in a purple bear costume with cartoon eyes, a wide mouth, and a too large head topping a body of shaggy lavender fur and a fully white chest and stomach. I let out a small laugh before catching myself looking back to make sure I hadn't woken up my roommate. It was so odd, but then so much of college was like that. People got drunk, people did hazing rituals, people did weird shit to be funny, stand out, or get laid. I looked down at the bear for a few seconds with mild amusement, but that was about it. He was just standing there, hanging out on the tall grass in the front of the building at like 2 in the morning, and, well, it was dumb and funny, but that was about it. I was about to close the window and try my luck outside when the bear turned and looked up at me froze for a moment, feeling weirdly caught for doing nothing more than looking out my window. I mean, it wasn't like I was spying on him or anything. He was just out there to be seen. Still, I gave him an awkward wave and felt a relief when he gave a giant pawed wave in return. 
and then he stopped waving, raising both of his arms as he began beckoning as though he wanted me to come down. I hesitated. I wasn't scared, but I was tired and not in the mood to get tangled up in uh, someone else's bullshit. But then the thought occurred to me that maybe the person in the suit was getting hazed and they needed help. Maybe they had to stand there at night or some dumb shit to get into whatever fraternity or sorority was torturing them. Maybe they needed something to drink or something. Do I really want to leave them hanging if I could take a minute and help them out? So I reluctantly nodded and gave them a thumbs up before putting on my shoes and heading downstairs. The dorm is laid out with the night exit being at the far end, so I had to walk out and around to get to the front lawn. When I did, I was pissed at first. There was no sign of the bear anymore, or that's what I thought. And then I noticed the crumpled pile of purple lying on the grass. I walked up to the discarded suit, moved it with my foot, as I looked around the yard. There was no sign of anyone. I figured they must have tossed it off as soon as I left the window. Thing was, I wasn't even sure how they'd gotten it off at all. As I looked closer at the bear costume, I didn't see any Velcro or zippers, no individual pieces or seams. It was all just fake fur and fabric, aside from whatever kept the head and shape and the mouth open. And looking into that mouth... It didn't look right. Even when I tilted the head toward the security light overhead, I couldn't see the inside of the costume. It wasn't just that it was dark. It felt wrong. Like, instead of looking into the mouth of a costume bear, I was staring down into something much darker and bigger. When I spoke near its yawning jaws, I even thought I could hear a faint echo from somewhere in the distant back. I threw the suit down and ran back to my room. I didn't sleep at all that night. But by the next morning when I looked out, it was gone. As Evan finished, a new card fluttered out of the air and landed on the table between us. It was laminated like the first, but this one was red. It said, Pick which story stays. Our reaction should have been fear or confusion anger or rebellion. We shouldn't have understood what it was asking for or been willing to decide so quickly. I'd like to say Peter and I didn't know the consequences when we stood up and walked closer to one another, but there was little point in lying now. Taking Peter's hand, we both spoke Evan's name in unison. For his part, he'd never argued or even bothered to stand. He just looked at us with sad eyes as the room began to grow dark. We found ourselves back out by the car with no trace of the sign, the bus, or Evan to be found. Peter and I got married the next year. Our little girl turned six this year. We've loved each other fairly well, I think, though that love has always been tainted by the guilt and shame of what we did. At the time, I tried to tell myself he was accepting of our choice, that he loved us and was willing to sacrifice himself to set us free. I don't think that anymore. Because last night I couldn't find our daughter. I searched the house from top to bottom, my calls becoming frantic and angry, and panic ripped into my chest. It wasn't until I reached the point of looking outside that I saw the trail of candy leading off our front porch and into the grass. The line of sweets was mainly hard candy, which Lexi didn't like, but I saw mixed in a couple of empty wrappers where she'd opened small chocolates as she made her way out to the yard. Heart pounding, I followed the trail across the yard and to the edge of the trees beyond, and there I saw where the candy led. To the open mouth of a dirty purple bear costume. 
The suit was empty and seamless, lying in a wrinkled heap except for the head, large and cartoonishly bulbous with wide eyes and an open maw that seemed impossibly large. Not just out of proportion, but so big it seemed less like a mouth and more like the small opening of a cave or a tunnel. Frantic, I picked up the suit and shook it as though I thought our baby might come tumbling out. When nothing came, I checked the mouth again. Evan had been right. Something was wrong with it. It didn't look like it should. But that didn't matter. I had to find Lexi. I called out to her again, and I jumped when I heard a responding sound. Not an answer, but the faint echo of my words coming from the cavernous mouth of the bear. I dropped the suit and stepped back, staring in horror as it landed with the mouth pointed toward me and whined enough to admit at first a small child and then a terrified mother. I heard a new sound from inside. It was Lexi, crying out to me, telling me she was lost, that she was scared that she needed me. I knew what this was without understanding it. It was a trap. A dare. I wept as I crossed the yard back to the house. I called Peter and 911 when I got inside, but I already knew they'd never find her. By the time they arrived, even the bear suit was gone. Maybe I should tell Peter about it, but I doubt I will. He's already troubled and distant these days. He stays late at work, and when he's home, he stays outside, tending to the yard as though to avoid me. Even at night, I hear him moaning and crying out for some recurring nightmare. I've tried asking him about it, but he only gives me a haunted, almost angry look before changing the subject or getting up to go outside. I think about the roadshow all the time now. I wonder if we found it or if it found us. If we could have done something different, if we ever really left at all. But of course we did. That's ridiculous. Whatever that place is, wherever it goes, we escaped it. I have to stop here. The noise is back again. Something's underneath the house and it's trying to get in. The Worst Customer by Will Rain I've been a waitress for a few years now, and I've seen more than my fair share of crazy things over that time. I don't think anything will ever compare to what happened yesterday, which is consequently what has me confined to a hospital bed for the time being. I still can't speak very well just yet, but fortunately typing isn't an issue. Either way, I need to talk about this even if it's just relayed through my phone. I'm no stranger to customers with an attitude, so I could tell right off the bat that this particular woman was going to be a handful as soon as she walked through the door. She didn't necessarily stand out much differently from the rest of the afternoon crowd in her baggy, flowery shirt, untucked from her neatly pressed dress pants down to black pumps. She was close to six feet high with her heels, likely dyed straight dark brown hair down to her shoulders with bangs that lay flat across her brow. It was the expression on her face that told me she was already prepared to neither be pleased with the service nor her forthcoming meal. The way her nose slightly creased upward as though she picked up on the scent of something foul as well as her grimacing mouth lined with poorly applied red lipstick didn't help matters either. If I were to guess, I'd estimate she was in her late 40s, early 50s, but even her mascara looked like a kid applied it for her. When she took a seat at a four-person booth beside the window facing out towards the interstate, I let out a sigh in preparation. Not only was she in my assigned section of the roadside diner, but there were plenty of two-person tables and booths available at the time. Why she felt the need to take up one of the few remaining family-sized tables, I couldn't say but things like this always irritated me, especially with it being the busier lunchtime hours. With the diner being right off the exit, surrounded by various other eateries and gas stations, we had frequent but sporadic crowds. 
the early afternoon was generally our most likely time to get slammed, and this day was no different. It's a fairly spacious place, but it does have its limitations, so one person taking it upon themselves to claim one of the bigger booths had a tendency to piss me off a bit. Not only would the bigger groups be more likely to leave a larger tip, something that anyone in any such profession depends on, but they were more profitable to the diner itself. Of course, I wasn't about to tell this lady she had to move. Something about her whole demeanor was standoffish, and I was not in any sort of mood to argue with a customer that day, or any other day to be honest. When she took her seat, she was already cutting her eyes around the place, glaring down her nose at the other customers while seemingly searching for her server as well. I gave an exhausted look to Ted, my best friend at the job and out of it for that matter, shaking my head and rolling my eyes. You want me to take this one? He asked, though I could hear the lack of enthusiasm in his offer of noble sacrifice. Nah, I got it. I replied with a sigh and... A very fake smile. I was tempted to take him up on it, but I couldn't throw a friend to the wolves just to save my own ass. Hi there, I said in my best imitation cheery voice, handing her a menu. I'm Shelly, and I'll be your... Do you serve hot tea here? She interrupted in a nasal and stern voice. We do indeed. Would you... I'll start with that, thank you. She cut in again, not looking up from the menu. I just nodded and headed back toward the kitchen, already feeling tense and a little flushed. Her voice reminded me of my old biology teacher, who was a bitter old ratty-haired bitch who came off like she couldn't stand any of her students. I always wondered why she chose to work in that field that required being around teenagers she clearly didn't have the patience for. Similarly, I was curious as to why this particular woman chose to come to a little roadside diner that she appeared to consider beneath her stature. That's how she came off to me anyway. After preparing her a cup of tea in the same manner we usually make it, hot water, lemon slice on the rim with a tea bag off to the side, I gingerly carried it to the table. What is this? She barked, prodding her finger against the lemon wedge, spilling the hot water across her finger in the process. Lemon, ma'am, it's how we usually prepare it, but I'd be happy. How hard is it to simply pour some hot water, hmm? She finally looked up at me while wiping her hand off with a napkin. Her eyes were wide and bloodshot, with wrinkled bags hanging beneath them. Everything about her expression made me feel as though she was in complete disgust at the time, not exclusively at the situation, but to me as well. I apologize, ma'am. I'll bring you a fresh cup. I reached for the mug while she looked at my hand with her painted-on eyebrows raised. You didn't answer my question. How hard is it? I bit down, attempting to keep my cool with this infuriating hag. It's not hard, ma'am. This is just how our regulars like it. I should have asked you how you liked it before. Yes, you should have. Now this time, bring me a cup of hot water and a tea bag. Nothing more. No fruit, no sugar, just hot water in a damned cup. Can you handle that? Yes, ma'am. My apologies. I attempted to sound as polite as I could while clenching my jaw so tightly that I felt it pop on one side. When I picked up the cup, I almost spilled more hot water across my own trembling hand, but I headed back to the kitchen in a hurry. Oh my fucking god. I sneered through gritted teeth when Ted came strolling up. Special kind of bitch, huh? I just nodded, rubbing my temples. If you need me to take over, just say the word. I couldn't do that to you, teddy bear. Again, I was incredibly tempted, but it would likely piss me off even more to see her giving him a hard time. In a weird sort of way, I can handle someone being rude to me more so than someone I care for. The last thing I needed was to lose my job over this wretched woman, and I would most definitely lose my cool with her if she bitched out Ted. After pouring a fresh cup for the cranky witch, I gave Ted an exhausted smile and made my way back into the belly of the beast. I hope this is more to your liking, ma'am, and I apologize for the- I would like a ribeye steak, as rare as you can make it, baked potato as a side, and then a glass of iced water that should have been provided when I arrived, she said, dipping the fresh tea bag and handing me the menu while reverting to avoiding eye contact. Yes, ma'am. I replied, keeping it short and sweet since she was unlikely to allow me to speak more than a word or two before cutting me off with another damn 
condescending demand. I swear, I can feel my blood boiling just recalling this part of the story. I do not understand why the hell anyone wants to be such a bitch to anyone who handles their food. Seriously, do they not watch the movies? Do they not care about what some disgruntled and exhausted restaurant employees may smuggle into their meals? It's not unheard of for someone to end up with a little extra special sauce on the side. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm sorry. I got a little carried away there. I'm good now. Let's get back to it. Being an average run-of-the-mill diner just off the interstate, we didn't exactly specialize in any particular dish. Our menu has a little bit of everything, but most of our customers aren't looking for anything fancy. As you can imagine, it's not exactly a classy steakhouse or anything, so nobody should expect that sort of quality. I sampled all three of the steak options on our menu over the years, and they're not bad, but they wouldn't be my first choice. That being the case, I was fully prepared for the queen bitch at table five to have something to say about it when I carried it out. I can't say I was prepared for what her actual concern was. What the hell is this now? She yelped once more, poking at what I brought her. With every prod of her bony finger, juice practically squirted from the meat. The squelching sound combined with the light patter of grease smacking against the table caused my stomach to churn as my face flushed again. I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian or anything, but it was just all around gross. The ribeye, ma'am. Just like, I clearly recall asking for it to be rare. Do you recall this? Were you listening? Did you... You asked... For as rare as we can make it, ma'am. Any rarer than that, and it would moo. <laughs> How dare you interrupt me? I've had just about enough of your attitude, young lady. I want to speak to your manager, right now. Yes, ma'am, I said, spinning on my heels back toward the kitchen. She was still saying something as I walked away from her, but I'd be damned if I was about to take another second of her shit. Rachel, one of our friendlier, more laid-back managers, was already walking my way when I got to the back. She just gave me an understanding smile, laying a hand on my shoulder as she passed by me. She's a good one, Rachel. Always been a cool person to work for, and she knows all too well what it's like to deal with difficult customers. Having been a waitress for herself for a few years, she has her own share of horror stories. This wouldn't be our first rodeo, but neither of us had dealt with a bronco that bucked this hard before. I was still trembling all over when she walked back into the kitchen letting out her own heavy sigh. <sighs> Holy shit, she said, tipping the undercooked meat with fresh poke marks into the trash can. That bitch is a special case. Right? She wants it raw? Give it to her raw. She gave a nod to Terry, one of the cooks. Toss it on there long enough for her to get warm. Leave it at that. Bitch wants salmonella, she can have it for all I care. <laughs> I love you. I said with a laugh. She just smiled, laying a hand on my shoulder again. You alright? You want me to take over? She asked, looking genuinely concerned. No, I got it, I said reluctantly. In all honesty, I almost took her up on the offer, but I didn't want this horrendous woman to think she beat me. If I just cowered in the kitchen while leaving someone I respected to take the heat, she'd think she won. It sounds a bit silly, looking back, but serving this foul heifer felt like a trial I had to complete. When I brought the incredibly undercooked meat back to her table, I tried to just lay the plate down and quickly turn around, but she wasn't about to let me off that easy. Don't you walk off, she barked before I even made it a few feet from the booth. I could already hear that squishing sound of innocent me being attacked by a slender finger, causing my neck to twitch a little. Is this supposed to be some sort of joke? Ma'am, this is what you asked for. I can have it cooked up a little more if you cooked more. Are you serious? What part of rare is so fucking hard for you people to understand? Ma'am, it doesn't get rarer than that. This is practically burnt, young miss, she sneered, still prodding the slab of meat that looked as though it had just been freshly carved off some unsuspecting cow. Burnt? Ma'am, I, I don't think... I want it bloody, you ignorant slut. Does this look bloody to you? My face was practically burning as my blood pumped far more rapidly. I could feel the eyes of many of the other customers who had stopped eating to glare at the dramatic scene this 
mad she-bitch was making. She was spitting with her words as her voice grew louder, and I wanted nothing more than to snatch up the disgusting slab of uncooked meat and smack it across her reddening face. I just couldn't wrap my mind around it. The fact that the already far too pink for human consumption steak was oozing sickeningly colored fluids with every poke, I couldn't even imagine what she expected. Still, even though I knew she would likely never be satisfied, I once more reached for her food with my trembling hand, praying she would just give up and leave already. Do you have a modicum of understanding how I would like this prepared now? She asked as I wrapped my fingers around the plate. I tried to reply, but I was so far beyond pissed at that point, I couldn't convince my brain to send the words to my mouth. Perhaps my question is a little too complex for your understanding. She looked up at me for the second time since she entered, but I would not return her gaze. I just continued to slide the unwanted dish away from her. I can help but wonder if I had attempted to show a little more completely undeserved respect to the mad bitch if things would have gone differently. No sense of pondering over things I can't change, I suppose. Not now, anyway. As I finally lifted the plate and began to turn away from her, she quickly reached out and grabbed my wrist, spilling the dish and its contents to the floor. She moved so swiftly I could barely rationalize it, but when she leaned forward and bit into my forearm, anything rational went out the window. I screamed out in horror as she tore away a chunk of my flesh and muscle tissue, spitting it onto the table. See? She shouted in a frenzied wail. I could barely believe what was happening. She just glared at me with those wide and maniacal bloodshot eyes, and my blood still dripping from her lips. Now that's a bloody chunk of steak right there. I just glared down at the fluids gushing from my grizzled wound in so much disbelief that I didn't even notice her moving in for a second time. As she wrapped her slender hands around my head, pulling me closer, I heard the voices and shrieks of many of the other customers when she chomped into my throat with her unbelievably sharp teeth, and I felt my head grow dizzy from the shock and pain. She pulled back, ripping away another strip of completely uncooked meat before releasing me to join her discarded steak on the floor. While I lay there, spraying sticky blood across broken shards of the plate that once held a steak that would surely make any average person sick to their stomach, I saw several of the diner patrons surrounding the insane woman. While everything was beginning to grow foggy and out of focus, I saw them pull her away from me before she could take another bite. When Rachel and Ted came up to where I lay, I felt one of them wrap a towel around my spewing neck before everything went dark. When I came to, presumably only moments after blacking out, I saw that the woman was now lashing out at those who attempted to stop her. It may have been nothing more than the blood loss causing things to appear more surreal, but I could swear I saw her fingernails extend and sharpen before my eyes. The chipped blue nail polish only lined the very tips of what appeared to be about two inches of razor-sharp claws. I watched on in pure horror when she reared back with her long, bony fingers before swiping them forward, tearing across the midsection of an older man in a green polo shirt. There was another spray of crimson as she swatted a blonde woman across the arm before she leaped straight forward, tackling a couple of guys who looked to be in some sort of sports team. I watched on, with my skin growing colder by the second, as she thrust her head down, pulling back quickly with another long strip of spewing flesh dangling from her mouth and slapping her across the face. When Ted attempted to get to his feet, seemingly intent on joining the efforts to halt the reign of terror caused by this mad bitch, I grabbed him by the arm as tightly as I could. Don't. I begged him. Not only was I terrified that I may lose every ounce of blood my body was capable of holding, but I knew he couldn't stop her. Whether I survived this or not, I couldn't stand the idea of anything happening to him. Police are on the way, Rachel said as she knelt back down beside me. Apparently, she placed the call as soon as she saw that I was still alive. She would tell me sometime later that she was almost paralyzed by the shock of seeing the woman attack me, leaving her ashamed she didn't act faster in calling the cops. While I fought to hold on to consciousness, a battle that I was closer to losing by the second, I could barely make out the crazy hag anymore with all the people surrounding her. As more blood sprayed across the windows and spilled onto the floor, I could only hope that at least some of it belonged to her. 
As soon as I saw the blue lights reflecting on the ceiling, I finally gave in to the overpowering exhaustion, closing my eyes and allowing the darkness to take me. At that moment, I had no doubt I was dying. In those brief seconds before everything faded from view, my mind no longer felt connected to my body as though it was drifting away somewhere over the rainbow and far away from batshit crazy and carnivorous nasty old bitches. When I woke in the hospital, both Rachel and Ted were passed out on chairs on either side of the room I was in. I was sort of out of it, between the likely high dose of whatever wonderful medication they had me on as well as that confusion of waking up in unfamiliar surroundings. When my mind flashed back to the events that led me here, I instantly grabbed at my neck to find it wrapped and padded, while somewhat numb to the touch. My forearm is in a similar condition, though it has some sort of brace around it as well. I can't move my fingers much on that hand, as the damage to my muscles and tendons will likely require a bit more work by the time everything is said and done. That's what the doctor told me anyway. Like I said in the beginning, all of this just happened yesterday, and I'm still a bit out of it. According to the police, a good seven of our customers are currently located in the same hospital, and a couple of them are in worse shape than I am. Everyone is expected to survive, thank God, but some have a good bit more recovery to go than others. From what I was told, that crazy bitch somehow slipped away when the police arrived at the scene. Ted said that it was unbelievable how quickly she moved, claiming that she shot out of there like a bat out of hell before the cops even got out of their cars. If nothing else, at least their arrival put an end to the madness of it all. It still terrifies me, though, the fact that she's still out there somewhere. I know this all sounds hard to believe. To be honest, I can barely wrap my mind around it, and I was there. There are some truly disturbed people in this world, but I've never heard of anything like this before, aside from that bath salts thing from some years back. Clearly, that doesn't mean it can't happen, all things considered. Though I truly hope that the authorities will be able to track down that insane heifer, her being out there is strangely not my biggest concern at the moment. It could be nothing more than the effects of the drugs, combined with the degree of my injuries, so I may be overreacting a little. Whatever it is, I have the strangest urge for some red meat right now. I've always preferred my steaks well done, but that doesn't feel all that appetizing at the moment. I could use something juicy. Maybe even a bit bloody. I wonder if they have a cafeteria here. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I know I did. They were a lot of fun. That second one it, it got a little a little wacky and wild there at the end, but definitely a very fun, fun story. I hope you all enjoyed it. And um, as far as a question for tonight's video, let me know down below, um, what's the worst job you've ever had? I'm just curious. I know I have older folks in the audience out there and some younger folks, people my age, but you know, that doesn't stop people from experiencing just bad jobs in general. I've worked three or four customer service jobs my entire life. And I have to be honest, they're some of the worst jobs I've ever worked. I worked at a Dunkin' Donuts, a Dollar General, and night shift at a Harris Teeter and a Target. And I will take a night shift job over a customer service job any day of the week, but, you know, I'd much rather lift heavy things and move a bunch of stuff than talk to people and be happy all the time. <laughs> That's just me, though, so let me know uh, what you, what's your worst job experience. Let me know down in the comment section below. I'd be really interested to hear if you've ever dealt with someone like this or maybe not a zombie, <laughs> which I assume that's what Will was going for with that story. Maybe not a zombie, but just someone who... It's just being incredibly difficult to be difficult, you know? Let me know in the comment section below, and shout out to all the people you see on screen right now. Those are our $5 patrons and members. Keeping the channel going here lately. Really, really appreciate y'all. Really appreciate everyone. Shows up, watches the video, leaves a like, leaves a comment, shares it with someone they think would like it. Um, 
But that'll be it for me tonight. I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful Friday morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. And as always, take care of yourselves and everyone around you. And stay safe out there. Good night, everyone.